All right, so <laughs> welcome to our video podcast. My name is Montgomery, and with me today I have. Uh, hi, I'm Alex. So for today we are doing an on kind of boxing video on Magic the Gathering, and the reason why we're doing this this way is because of COVID nineteen. Uh, we're not able to do this in person with um, people from the outside because we're still temporarily closed. But um, just to kind of give you a background, I'm going to kind of talk about this, or we'll talk about what is our interest about Magic the Gathering in general. And then really, Alex is really the kind of, uh, uh, what's the right word? The one who spearheaded about the whole new pack deck that got me interested, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So, um, so for me, being the old guy in the room, literally, uh, I remember when Magic the Gathering first started, literally when it first started back in the early 90s, I think. Um, yeah, I think so, like 90. Yeah. It, it it's, must have it's, been pre-92. because it, It's so last entry, I forgot how old it is. <laughs> uh, and that's the thing that I kind of got into it because I'm like, it's interesting and it's easier to kind of work with the cards as opposed to like Dungeons and Dragons, which is a little bit more elaborate, but this one is a, it's a really easy, quick game to kind of like jump into, you kind of understand the rules and play with 20 hit points. And when it goes, it goes down to zero, you lose the game and that's it. So okay. uh, that's my thing. I'm like, oh, this is kind of cool. And then after that, um, other card games became a big thing, but Magic was really like the genesis of what is still going on still today. So, uh, but again, we'll talk about why I'm back into Magic again. So talk yeah. to me about what you're interested in. All right. I mean, um, you know, so I guess starting with like what interested me in Magic more than anything, mm -hmm. um, the earliest memory I have of Magic is being introduced to it. Um, my friends in like elementary school just being like yeah this game's kind of cool it's kind of like Yu-Gi-Oh and like all this and being excited to be like yeah that's cool and looking at the cards and be like I have no idea what any of this stuff says you know um but yeah I started actually with other card games and then eventually moved towards realizing that magic is actually there's a reason magic has been around as long as it has as opposed to something like Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh which they have been more or less around at the same time right. but their their communities tend to be a little bit more finicky as mm. opposed to magic like you will always see the same people playing magic and the same people playing those same decks and, and right. playing to those effects so um for me it's more in recent years that i got comfortable with it because I just found fr friends to play with, which is what it comes down to. It's like what you said with D&D &D is it's really hard to jump in because you see something like cards and you're like, well, everything's laid out for you as opposed to you creating the game as you go. Right. Um, it's really easy to be like, well, even if I can't brew a deck, somebody else can and I can mm -hmm. follow their list. And if I want to make changes, I can. Right. And if I don't want to make changes, I could be like, well, I don't want to make changes. And that's that. Um, so it, it just kind of becomes fun because it almost becomes this like almost like like a, a, a masochistic goal of like you're always losing and you'll always lose in the same spots over the same things but but you always strive to like improve your decks and your cards and and different things in ways to like move forward and it teaches you strategy in a way where games like chess can't because mm. even with chess like there's infinite possibilities but even those, not to sound uh, contradictory, but even those infinite possibilities have an end mm. versus with magic because it's a constantly changing game. Those infinite possibilities become even more infinite with every new set. Um, so it's cool to see like the different um, mechanics and rules and rule sets that they implement um, with each set and then you end up looking at it and you're like wow i wonder how that plays with you know this card from 92 and you know in your mind you're like well those cards will never interact mm -hmm. except that magic is one of the only games that actively reprints cards that are really popular that aren't like banned in particular 
Um, so it, it's fun to see a game that's the size of Magic that still continues to progress. So that so that's what really got me into it, and and still maintains a pretty strong, um, a pretty strong game because you mm-hmm. you run into games like Yu Gi Oh and Pokemon where eventually, you know, you'll have some sets that come out and everybody's super excited for them. And then they come out and you're like, well, this, you know, they have to change up whole rules in the game because they implemented this new mechanic that doesn't play well with other mechanics from the game or past mechanics from the game. Or like with Pokemon in particular, they get stuck with um, having to move forward with whatever's happening in the video games. So, you know, they'll have like GX cards and like in the games, there was nothing equivalent to GX, but then mega evolutions came out and now they're like well we have to put it mega evolutions in the card games and it's like well you don't but you did and then you know gigantamax came out with the new set and so then you know all these things happen and you're changing the core structure of the game where magic is like we're going to implement some rules but that's not going to change your gameplay that's that's just going to change card interactions but you're still going to see those card interactions between you know a card that came out today and a card that came out in 92 um so that's what got me like super into it i'm just fixing the lighting because i see it bouncing around a little bit all right um but yeah um so it's it's cool to see that and there's a lot of really fun things that i've seen already in the new set that i'm super super excited about outside of like the king of the monsters theme right going on so and the reason why um and what I got excited is because you're a Magic the Gathering player and because we wanted to introduce this as a, a library event. I mean, we also put it uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon and Magic was going to be part of that. Um, and we kind of had some kind of momentum going on. And then, of course, the COVID happened and then it all went downhill. Yeah. But you had mentioned to me uh, some months ago about this new deck. Uh, which yep. I was thinking my head was calling Ikea. Naya <laughs> Corey. <laughs> uh, okay. And it was just this one word that you mentioned. It's it was, close enough. To yeah, be fair. exactly. But you mentioned um, Godzilla was coming into this yes. pack, and I'm like, what? Yeah. So, so I, got, they, I got, that's what got my interest. I'm like, I want to get back into this now because of Godzilla. Yeah. yeah the, the, actually, the most disappointing thing about the Godzilla cards is. They're they're still part of the game, so um, like I have a couple here, and I can I can show them in a little bit. Sure. Um, but the the Godzilla cards themselves have like subcategories, so like they have sub names. Um, so they have like Godzilla, I think King of the Monsters, and then it has whatever the sub name is. The sub name is actually what the card name is within the series. Mm-hmm. So they're still like permanent staples of the series, but the Godzilla themed ones are they're they're almost like promo cards basically right. and they you there's very specific way for you to get them and it's really simple but because they're such like limited you know specifically godzilla mothra and um Ghidorah, mm-hmm. since they're specifically limited of those three cards right. those three cards happen to now be like ridiculous prices so it's cool because you can still actively play those cards like it's not like they're gone from the set you you didn't get them you missed out um you can still like for me in particular like i really want the mothra card um and it, i need it as a staple of one of my brews but right. the the issue comes in like you know even if if i want to get the mothra card i'm paying upwards of like 50 plus dollars versus mm. like just getting the no name not mothra but not not mothra that one i'm paying maybe 15 bucks for but right. even then i'm looking at them and i'm like but i want the mothra card <laughs> i don't right i don't want luminous broad moth i want Mothra. Mothra, right. right. Yeah, so I, I think the fun of that, because I am a big kaiju fan and I love these guys, I want to get yeah. back into that. Um, so while many of us were sheltered in, uh, some stores did open up and I was able to get um, my own starter deck, so to speak. Mm, yeah. Came with like, uh, like a 10, 15 card booster pack that we're going to do an unboxing video of that and we're going to react to that because she hasn't seen what I have. And she also bought a huge pack <laughs> of I posters. 
for the well, viewers like, at home, I bought yeah. a booster box. He bought a fat pack. So. Yeah. So, um, I mean, it's a it's a big difference. But yeah, it is. the fact that she got Godzilla and I'm like, but I wanted one. Too. Yeah, I will say that's the one thing, like I was saying, that's disappointing about it is that they're, they're box toppers, which means the only way for you to get those cards mm-hmm. is for you to spend, you know, that hundred plus dollars to right. get one card not even two of them one card um then outside of that like some card shops they had promotional packs so it was like you know you get the one card that comes in the box and then because you bought it through them they give you another card on top of that but that's their promotion not wizards of the coast so it's really weird how wizards of the coast handled this um especially with how much they like push this set back because of all the like coronavirus stuff and like covid Mm -hmm. and all this um and so it's it's really funny to see how they handled the launch of this because it was also like, well, it, it's got to come out. So it's out now, Yeah, you know, and it's fine in the moment. But then, you know, as a player that's stuck at home, you're like, yeah, but I want to I want to go to Friday Night Magic or like I want to go and hang out with my friends. Like right. opening a whole box of packs is great. But if you don't have your friends reactions to see what what they're excited about, it, right. it's a different um, it's a different vibe that goes along with it but it's still fun because you know even now i have friends that are like texting me and they're like all right what'd you pull and i'm like ah nothing (laughs) (laughs) whole box of nothing yeah but that's why we want to kind of recreate that kind of unboxing kind of moment um again because we would have done this as a library event and we would have bought our own decks and had start doing this in front of people and and whatnot but we're closed So in the meantime, we have to do this kind of virtual type of program. So hopefully this is going to be the first of many, meaning we'll do an unboxing today. I would love to do a tutorial video because I need to kind of get a reacclimate to that world all over again. And even though you taught me how to (laughs) play again. Yeah. uh, we can i i can definitely afford to be a better teacher right. um i didn't have the best teacher um my my friend basically threw me in the deep end and right. was like here's the hardest format possible right uh and then when i didn't get it for eight months is when we started opening up to other friends and then they were like actually there's an easier way for you to learn and then by that point i was already being hard-headed so i was like well i already started here so i'm just gonna get comfortable here and everything right. else is that much easier um it doesn't always work like that and mm. thankfully with magic it doesn't work that like that ever. Right. <laughs> so yeah. it's just, you know, but it, it's slow, steady steps. A lot of times is boiling the game down to like removing all the extra effects mm-hmm. and just teaching the, the basics first right. and then introducing the actual like full, full range mechanics. Right. Um, Cause the full range mechanics is where everything tends to get a little bit, a little bit muckier. Like I still have trouble sometimes where I'm like, mm. <laughs> what's the difference from a card getting, plus one plus one and a plus one plus one counter right you know and you're looking at it and you're thinking about it and in your mind you're like well it's the same and it's like well no because the plus one plus one is a static ability and the other one's a counter and those are two very different instances in which you get plus one they have the same effect but in different definitions which you know you get into those like really in-depth mechanics and you get start getting comfortable with the stack and you're like which is right over my head already as you're talking i'm like yeah what? it's yeah you think <laughs> trust me you think that's bad is like when you get really really deep into the game there's this point where you start someone will start teaching about the stack um and basically the stack is how priority happens in the game so magic mm-hmm. and and this is one of those things that i actually appreciate magic over other card games is because the stack exists and the stack's really annoying because you have to pay like extra attention to it but it's the way things resolve in the game so um if you have a card that plays an instant speed but i have something that plays a flash speed but i'm playing it on your turn and supposed to play on my turn how that card affects this card and that card and uh, you know it's your turn which means you have priority but i played an instant which means i have priority so then you get to allow it but then it it gets so like right. convoluted i still have issues learning like combat tricks which is right. you know you play a card at instant speed but you know yeah whether you play it here or you play here the effect still you know even even if it follows through the effect still falls through but the effect that i would have gotten here would have been more effective than if i played it here right. so it's it's so like complex but when you get deeper into it like i was saying earlier like it almost becomes this masochistic goal where you're like, 
I don't care how many times I lose. I just want to understand how this works now. Like I just, I want to know how my deck plays. Right. You know? and you'll start hearing it when you get deeper into the community where people will tell you like one of the most difficult things is someone just handing you a deck and you have no idea what's in there. Right. And it could be the perfect deck, a hundred percent, you know, win rate. You're always going to pass. There's no, no doubt. Every piece in that deck is crucial. And if you play it at the right time, it, you're guaranteed to win but if you don't know how to pilot it you don't know how to pilot it and it, it just falls through and it doesn't matter whether the other deck is more or less powerful that's going to show in your play style so it's fun to start seeing that kind of stuff and seeing like you know my commander deck is super simple and my friends are like oh it's the easiest thing on the planet but then they get my deck and i'm like well you're playing it wrong though right you know and they're like well you from the from the outside in, you're like, well, how do you play it wrong? And it's like there's mm-hmm. plenty of ways to play it wrong. Right. Uh, so hopefully we'll have plenty of time to like yeah. really do a deep dive as much as we can. And hopefully, you know, if the videos are popular enough that we'll get to do virtual gameplay from our patrons outside and they can join us somehow, we'll figure it out. Um in the meantime. Um I do want to go into our unboxing video just so we can talk about the cards that I have and I'll have lots of questions and Alex is going to talk about her cards and what she has because yes. I already know she's got Godzilla so that was my happiness two. for today I've got um, two gojis oh see <laughs> doesn't want to share yeah well, so, if they were the same ones I feel like one. no problem yeah they're here we go the same. they're two you different have, cards one's a dinosaur one. and the other one's a dinosaur turtle which Seems like the dinosaur turtle right? is called Gamera. Mm-hmm. Uh, not in Magic. I know. In magic in Magic actually, his name is Yidato. So there's that. Looks like Godzilla. <laughs> Which I think I think I might have actually pulled out a couple of those. So the alternative versions of these two cards, I pulled up, I pulled yeah. one or two of. So that was kind of cool. Okay. Forget it. Open the box. Open the box. What's in the box? Oh, cards. Cards and oh, sadness. It's not <laughs> that kind of movie. No. No. All right. So I was kind of happy to see that I got a nice little. Uh... A turn down. Is that what it is? Yeah. So that's actually something that happens in Magic. I don't have any here to hold, for example. Hmm. But um, they'll give you a 20 sided die. Right. Um, but it's not a natural 20 sided die because normally a uh, 20 sided die, the numbers are randomly allocated. Uh, they give you what is referred to as a turndown. So all of the numbers from one side to the other go from, no matter where you start, goes either from 1 to 20 or 20 to 1. So when you turn it, you go down, up, or down one number. Got it. So you cannot use The litter to tell you to go to learn how to play on Wizards. Yeah, can't use it on D&D. All right, so... I mean, you could, because your numbers would still technically randomly generated oh but i know but it's better be, not to yeah right it would be frowned upon in the wizards of the coast community wizards. so i had a much easier time opening up these uh clear packs than the other ones but we'll get into that yeah uh, so we talked about this briefly which you have the lands have been reprinted right. Uh, and it, you can see in the videos that their video is going to be is foil pack ish. You can see the nice little uh, yeah. coloration. Um, and as you mentioned, is that the Magic has already basically just reprinted these cards all over again. But it's just, uh, I guess, it's more of an interest to kind of keep people more just like oh, you know, wisdom. Bang. Yeah, I think it's still good for um, like entry level players. So like you go in. And let's say you go and buy yourself like a whatever starter deck at, you know, Walmart or Target or wherever you're buying your cards at. Um, you know, you don't really have all those lands. So at the beginning, you're like, oh, this is great. And then later, when you get a little bit more in depth into the game is when you start to kind of like, I have, you know, boxes of lands that I'm never going to use because I don't, I don't have a purpose for them. Right. Um, you know, it actually gets to the point where if you need land for any purpose whatsoever, you go to any of the events at your local card shop, they have 
freebies that they're just laying around and you just go and pick them um the nice differences to see are the the different like art styles and stuff like so you see all these different um you see like both those were lands but they both have different art within the actual frame um so it's fun to see that and see how the lands build up more or less the lore or i guess maybe like the the landscape of what Mm -hmm the the realms and magic look like so like these would be from the ikoria realm so all of the like interior designs are from ikoria and then your little promo guy yeah now when you're building your deck mm-hmm. and i've seen people putting their cards into plastic sleeves which would also put the lands also in the plastic sleeves yeah well you have to um, okay. because what what ends up happening is out of your, you know, depending on which format you're playing, like, let's just go off of the logic of standard is like out of your 60 card deck, you want everything to be in sleeves because, you know, if everything but your lands are in sleeves, then me as That's your opponent, tell-tale. I'm going to look at it and be like, well, now, you know, when you're drawing lands versus now I know when you're drawing lands and I can fight against okay. that. Um, so, I mean, you could be that guy and be like all but my lands, but everybody will look at you like you're insane and you have to do it right you're um, telltale your moves yeah which is ultimately just a big no no like no one no one would allow that regardless but um <clears throat> but there there's still value in it um like with the last set they had like special special design lands mm-hmm. that looked extra cool in my right. opinion there was there was sort of a, a split in the magic community where between the people that really really liked the design and the people that hated the design um but you get like the nicer lands and like full art lands and different things to to bypass these like you know these these lands are their values are less than a penny you know like i said you can get them anywhere for free like you can go to any card shop and they won't be happy about it but if you need like a stack this big of islands they'll they'll give you the stack of islands so you could say that this land was made for you and me. <laughs> this land was made for everybody. This for land, cheap. <laughs> this land is quite literally our lands. <laughs> yeah. So yay! Now we get into the actual, the actual booster deck, and here's me struggling. I'm like, I can't open these. Uh, yeah, and then, is, and then and then you were telling me there's a special little notch on top. There's and... a yeah, there's a a new thing in these. I don't know, maybe they didn't have it. Your your fat pack might have been from like an older run, and I still yeah. don't understand why you would cut it that way. Like, <laughs> I get anxiety just looking at it because if you had anything of value, that would have just like, like just just that one cut. Just a little uh, again, too far you're talking in. to someone that doesn't really have that kind of. Uh, That's fair. That's fanaticism that I'm like, oh my god, what the hell are you doing? Yeah, so yeah, your little one one human token, human yeah. soldier. That's one thing with this new set is like I, I really like the art style that they went with. It looks really good. You got yourself a little legendary. So, yeah. you know, one of your commanders, you could do something with him, maybe. Five color commander too. Little little sorceries. Yeah, so a lot of this is going to be like, okay, uh, except for something cool like that. Um, yeah, so like those are actually super cool. I actually really like those because they're like mythical cards that are full arts. Right. It, it's almost like a way to curb when you want that special card, but it's a little bit more common. Mm-hmm. Um, this one's pretty cool. Destroying target artifacts and um a lot of these are really cool they focus a lot on like that morph ability that you saw in that first one Mm -hmm. Um, my friend was telling me that there are there's always like a main deck that you kind of want to strive to achieve in these decks and and one of them is that like that morph deck which is you using that morph ability to like cheat stuff in and ramp up the speed in your deck right um, so there's a lot of really cool ones. This little like vanilla one five. Um, um, and I know from past years that there were special cards that were with mm-hmm. white borders versus the black borders. Is that even a thing or? Yeah, I mean, so there there was kind of like 
so there were three versions of that. There's the black for there the black border cards, the white border cards, and the silver border cards. Mm-hmm. Um, black and white border cards are entirely 100% legal. Like there's nothing that's stopping you from using them, um, right. except maybe aesthetics. Like if you have an entire deck of all black border cards and you get that one if you're like me you're gonna get that one white border card and you're gonna be like uh, i don't i i, I want i'd rather not have that white border um right. the silver bordered are something called like an unsanctioned card um which means 100 percent beyond shadow of doubt all of those cards are banned in some form because ultimately what that card does is like it'll i have one called squirrel detective or something like that Uh um and basically what it does is if i play that card in an actual game i can go outside to people outside of the game and be like hey do you like squirrels and if the answer is yes then i get a one one squirrel on my field so it's like pointless and it's it does nothing for the overall (laughs) arc of the game but it's kind of really yeah there's like a whole play format around that of like cards that like they recently released a set that was um my little pony based and okay. all of the car all of the cards in this set they were all silver bordered cards so they're not tournament legal you can't put them in anywhere in your deck right um and every one of the cards was like well you know you all win because you're all friends you all had a good time or like you all lose because you didn't have a good time and you're not friends like it was all stuff like that and it was like oh, in it, like immediately yeah nobody wins um so it was kind of cool to see um yeah, so like right now we're watching through your video, and I imagine we're gonna see a lot of like duplicates, and we're gonna see a couple here and there that yeah, you might have gotten that I might not have, despite getting a booster box. Um, yeah, this one I thought was kind of cool that they kind of do these hybrid creatures. Um, so that was a tiger gorilla. <laughs> that was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I noticed that while I was opening my packs and it's like you know it, it's a little disappointing because you want to go in for the godzilla cards of course um, and then you realize they're they're technically in the set but they're not technically in the set right um but it's fun to see that one's a fun little card i actually like that art style more than the last one that they just added um yeah but one thing i really appreciate is uh like this set as we see back here is called Aquaria Lair of the Behemoths. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really like the heavy chimera focus that they had. Um, I don't know how much of that. Oh, look, you can see the little tick that you completely ignored. Uh-huh. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it's fun to see all the different chimeras. And I don't know how much I'll specifically be implementing yeah into my own gameplay because it, it's it's very specific like the companion features is a mechanic that i don't entirely understand but i want to understand because it mm-hmm. looks like it would be a lot of fun right um this one looks super cool too that's another commander right. might he might be fun for like um a Rakdos commander deck Rakdos is the the name of the black mm-hmm. red clan so in magic there are the five separate colors so the black white red blue green um and then each color combination has its own name right um do you think that the companion would be like uh, put it in terms of of in D &D, uh something similar to um a character that you would meet that I'm trying to figure out what's the right word to say this. Mm. Um, that you would encounter or they would assist you, but not necessarily are they going to be like with you, like you can kind of direct them. You think it's um, like a standalone thing? Yes and no. Okay. Uh, I, know, I know how the rules integrate more or less within Commander. Uh, okay. And I know that they've changed a little bit because they're, there's a whole there. There's a whole card in here that if either one of us pulled, I would have screamed because it's kind of cool, um, because it's like super broken. Like it's so broken that before the the set even came out, they were like, no, it's not. It's not legal. No one can use it. Right. <laughs> so I mean, you know, within your own play group, you can, but everybody's gonna be really upset about it. Um, but the basically the way that com- the companion works is like when you're playing a game like Commander. 
and I've explained it to you before, you have your like one main card and what he does, and then everything in that deck is built around that main card. So, okay. um, like for example, and I hate that I keep referring to them because I know it's kind of like it, it feels like I'm rubbing your face in it. It's not, I promise. Um, but like there's the Godzilla cards. The Godzilla card is like a legendary card. So this one in particular, he's just a red dinosaur turtle or whatever. Yeah, um, so he'd be your main commander. Right. Right. Um, in him being your main commander, you would have a deck of 99 cards with the exception of like your land cards that all build up to make him powerful or use him to build up the deck and have you win. So mm-hmm. basically what a companion would do is instead of having just the one main commander, um, you pair them together. Okay. So you have both of them outside and you can pay their converted mana cost, uh, which is that cost right there. And we can explain that to you in particular, like at a later time. Um, <clears throat> but instead of paying that com- that commander cost when it's in your hand you pay it when it's whenever you're ready basically but that's a big part of it but basically the companion goes along with that one so it's it's almost like when it, it's like a secondary command zone so instead of you having one card that's outside of the deck that you can play at any time for its converted mana class you have two of them um and then you can use their abilities uh usually the companions will say like you know you don't have to play this card but if you don't play this card it'll do this or if you if you play this card it'll do this um and then, then it it'll tell you its companion ability um so yeah the, this deck it, this set is very like dinosaur heavy uh-huh. dinosaurs are cool cuz they're like they're they're pretty big boys and you're you know you're you're paying smallish amounts to get them out. Yeah. I mean, in, in fairness, you know, if you're into mm-hmm. dinosaurs or kaiju, uh, battling monsters, so to speak, I think that's where I think the value of kind of like jumping into this um, new edition because, I mean, it's cool to have like different spells and creatures that you can form, but if you can have giant monsters kind of be part of the gameplay i think that's um a big interest for me right um yeah and that was a big part of it with me was i i jumped back in with the i forgot what the one before it was it was core 2020 and then there was another modern set that came out um and then right after that we got thrown throne of eldraine mm-hmm and Throne of Eldraine was super, like, storybook heavy. So they didn't outright say, like, Little Red Riding Hood and Goldilocks and the Three Bears. and like, But all of the cards that came out were centered around, like, essentially right. the Grimm's Brothers fairy tales. So it was super cool to see. And they brought out, like, new mechanics, like the adventure mechanic. And, you know, they implemented that into the game in what I felt was a pretty good fashion. This card is super cool. I think we both pulled one of these. Mm-hmm. Um and just like they're they're all really cool cards they're it's super like i said it's super dinosaur heavy so i don't know how much use i'll get out of them um but i want to try um i actually i'm not even sure that i pulled that i imagine that i did because there's at some point where you uh you're seeing that little marmoset again yeah. marmoset's really good um but yeah there, there's one point when you start opening packs that you just it you you know you've seen it a thousand times so you're just like okay cool <laughs> moving on to the next one let's go um so when you actually open up your packs mm-hmm. do you start organizing it by the the colors about the land by the like duplicates i mean how would you organize your stuff um so usually it depends um depends on what i'm doing if i'm if i'm in the middle of a draft like i'll separate out um based off of I'll, I'll separate out a couple different ways i'll separate by color i'll ser- separate by converted mana cost um i'll separate lands from everything else um usually i'll do that after i'm done just because when you're in a draft you're trying to like pick and go you're you're not trying to like start separating right then and there you you want to look for the best options for creating you know your deck and we can even try to like 
recreate what a draft would look like in a video because it, it it's actually kind of like obnoxiously like nerve-wracking to start in a draft but usually for me in particular if I'm just opening opening packs like this with friends and we're just going one by one and we're looking at what cards we've pulled um usually I'll separate out like my mythics and my rares and my the colors so I'll you know anything that's red will go in a red pile anything that's blue will go in a blue pile and then I'll separate them out that way oh that one looks super cool yeah Napoleon Dynamite will be like in love with that because it's the Liger <laughs> Yeah, the the Liger, I mean, I just, that's even more of what I'm saying, though, is, like, the the heavy Chimera theme mm -hmm. in this set is just so exciting. Um, that's a mean card with pacifism. It's a good one. Yeah, there's a lot of really cool mechanisms in this one. I'm interested to see, um, like, as someone who plays Commander, more than like standard or anything else i'm interested to see how some of these play out in commander um because i think i was telling you about it a little bit of like how card interactions work and how the stack works and so there's a lot of cards in this set where i i read them and i'm like i'm interested to see how that's going to play in the stack Oh, phased often that that phased often card I, I always feel every time i see it i'm like the art style looks like it's a whale yeah blazing volley there we go on to the next back yeah and then you'll see um unfortunately i messed up my video so we'll see in mine where um i don't even think the packs are in order i just went 15 cards at a time that's all right they uh, were they were more or less in order because they were right you grouped them when you opened up. The, yeah they were all part of the packs but like these little like no table required packs i had already pulled them out and tossed them out yeah. and everything see so like going this through them, i'm like this i'm kind of ticked that it was just a wasted card well just... okay so when they do that they don't remove the card so the, basically you're getting one extra mm -hmm. And the one extra is that card, but you're not you're not missing out on a card. Mm, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty cool. That like extra fancy boy land. The Hal Bonder. Yeah. Yeah, and then if at any point we want to stop and like double check any of these, like, I mean, it would just be me throwing names and words at you and stuff, but. There's there's a lot of really th these this all ties back into actually like these little tokens, right. um, so it plays a lot with like as I've actually seen this set use a lot of these sort of rules so like menace and first strike and mm -hmm. I don't think I've seen any hex proof yet but I also I don't look at all that the flash abilities not that there's a flash token but you know um it is interesting to see some of these cards and just be excited about like building a deck and i, I think that's the next step that i want to do is after we've gone through and seen the cards is building something around the decks that seem viable it'll it'll be <laughs> equal parts difficult just because right. i'm terrible at brewing but you also i know i know how overwhelming it can be at first when you're when you're looking at your cards and you're just like i don't I don't know how any of these interactions are. I don't know what this does. I don't know what a good card is or a bad card. And yeah, I think I went too far with the cut there. Oh, I, I'm like, what? I think one of my cards. Yeah, hopefully yeah. it was like. See this first one. I think that's a, also a token too. But this first one's the one that bugs me, where it's like, go to your local card shop, and it's like, okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> where did I get them? At my local card shop. Right. Like, okay, you want me to go to the <laughs> city? Like, I can't buy them from you directly. Um, I mean, I guess if you bought them from like a Walmart or Target or like a big box store, like, yeah. <gasps> oh, you got the boy. Okay, so this one, if you want to pause here real quick. Um, oh, I, oh. or if you want to like go back and so oh, Lutri well, yeah. mm -hmm. earlier when I was talking about the companions yeah, uh, and, and the ones that are the, the one that's banned mm -hmm. uh, Lutri is actually that card so Lutri is 
a companion. I forget what exactly his conditions are, but his conditions basically break the game mm-hmm. and make it so like the moment someone sees him as your companion, they're gonna they're gonna tell you no. Yes. <laughs> they're not even gonna try to play you. Um, right. And there are answers to it, but a lot of times to keep the game fair, companies like Wizards of the Coast or Pokemon or Namco Bandai will be like, well, we just won't play it in. And it's like, okay, sure. <laughs> Within its place that it would have been fine, but... Right. Now, here's a question. In regards mm-hmm. to having cards that are playable versus that are just like, you can't because it makes it too powerful, what was the purpose of them creating this in the first place, other than maybe for collectability? I mean, is there a logic behind that? Um, I mean, so as far as I've understood, what ends up happening is that they'll they'll create these sets and batches like three or four months ahead of time. So like this set, you know, came out now, and they were probably working on it when Core Twenty Twenty was coming out. Mm-hmm. So what ends up happening is that they end up creating these cards and they create these cards in closed group sets where they're testing it against themselves and the sets that are coming out with it for standard play, basically. Um, So in the moment, it's kind of hard to see because as I mentioned, like in, in our little intro, um, what ends up happening is that you have all these different card interactions that you don't know about because there's some cards that, are standard legal that are from 92 and then you have cards that aren't standard legal that are from 2020 and you're just looking at it you know and there's a lot of confusion that comes with it so as far as i've understood the reason that stuff like that happens is because they'll build and make the card but they won't see those card interactions until they release it to the greater community and then that's when everybody's like well hold on wait a minute what happens when this happens as opposed to this so like right um, that's pretty cool. You actually got a King Kong card. Yeah, well, so was, King Kong. I, but... Right, exactly. But I was like, okay, so I have Godzilla, and I'll get have my Kongs, mm-hmm. and I can have my little fight in my head. Right, and I mean, in the long term, you can eventually pick up Godzilla cards. Um, yeah, you're not going to get like the full art foils or whatever. But if you want them just to have them, like mm-hmm. um, these that I pulled, I looked them up today, and they're like fifteen, twenty bucks, both of them. I think. Um, the Doom Inevitable card right. was the cheapest one that I saw, and that one was I think ten bucks, which which sounds like a lot, um, but you'll hear it a lot throughout like when you get deeper and deeper into the community, where you know it, it seems like a lot to ask for like ten or fifteen bucks a card, but then you're mm-hmm. looking at you're looking at five six dollars a pack. You know, you're looking at a forty dollar fat pack that brings you a right, ten. You, right, you're guaranteeing the car that you want and you need. Right, as, as opposed to spending. spending those ten dollars on a singular pack, and then you're mm-hmm. like, "Well, what now?" Right. Um, and it, it happens. Even I do it. Like I have cards that are twenty, thirty bucks, and someone's like, "Well, how'd you get it?" And I'm like, "Well, I spent the twenty, thirty bucks." And someone's like, "Oh my god, that's a lot of money for a card." And you're like, "What is?" But like, it's out of print, or I can't grab it, or like right. I bought it on sale, and you know different interactions like that. That that you know in the moment you're like, yeah, it is a lot of money. I really wish I hadn't done that. But if you take that money and turn it into like whatever else you'd spend the money on, at least you got a card out of it, and you can resell that card later for the same value. Right. Um, All right. Last, ooh, last pack. Yeah, so it'd be fun to see um, what either of us could build from that. And we both could build our own separate decks, I think. I don't think one of us will build build something functional out of that. The other one probably won't. But um, like that, Vivian and her little monster, little human soldier token. But yeah, the, this game gets a little bit more expensive when you start looking in at like custom tokens and, ooh, a phoenix. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah, I wanted to record for my whole box, and and that's you know maybe what I should have done. Just gone off the bat and like fifteen cards at a time. Yeah. Um, done the whole booster box, but I, I felt that that would be a little bit overkill. So again, I'm I'm yeah. kind of happy with what I've seen so far. Right. Um, it's gonna be the next level once we pass um, the unboxing is to kind of say, well, as I said, how am I going to use what I have 
and build that deck and see right. what I can maximize my creatures, my lands, and things of that nature. Right. Um, so. Yeah, and we when we go over um, my video, I'm just checking on time and if we would be able to do that. And I think we will, but um, we can go through and pause between and like I can walk you through um, the different card elements that mm -hmm. come up in this set in particular. Because like I said, we're going to see a lot of duplicates and there's going to be a lot of cards, obviously, that you have that I might not have. Right. Or that I have that you won't have. Um, but we can go through and see what those different card elements are. Like I can explain to you a lot better and more in depth than the first time around what an instant is, what a sorcery is, what, you know, an enchantment is, an enchantment aura is, thing, things like that. Um, and it, it's going to seem like a lot at first. It will always seem like a lot at the beginning yeah. um, because it is. You, I mean, you know, it's, it'll just be me throwing words at you and you're going to look at me like I'm crazy because you have no idea what, you're, what I'm talking about. But when you start to get a little bit more comfortable with it, you're going to start looking at me a little bit less crazy, little by little by little. And eventually you're going to be like, oh, I understand now. Right. Mine is obviously a little different because I just pulled packs from my uh -huh. box. <laughs> uh, you see my cute little little adventure here. Godzilla's. Oh, my little Godzilla's. Both They're sides. great cards. I don't know if I'm going to end up using them. I, I probably won't. But um, well, maybe. If they They're go just... missing, don't blame me. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, I'll probably blame someone else first. But um. Yeah, so I'm I'm less chaotic in my opening methods and just went straight across because mm -hmm. I'm not an abnormal human being. Um, oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I care a little bit more about the longevity and quality of my cards. <sighs> um, so you'll see me there getting annoyed that I got that litter. Um, I'll probably go through them a little quickly. Um, the octopus is one that I really appreciate. So mm -hmm. like off the bat here is... Um, just to explain it quickly on this card and then we can go over it more in depth in like future videos and stuff but mm -hmm. um so this top right corner up here where you see the two water symbols and then the one that's the converted mana cost right um the bottom left where you start seeing all the text this is the creature type so it'll tell you if it's a creature or uh, sorry the card types so it'll tell you if it's a creature instant sorcery or mm -hmm. enchantment enchantment or and so on so on and forth right. um the basically the house alignment so if it's um one of the godzilla cards it'll say dinosaur or turtle uh -huh. dinosaur or whatever this one's an octopus um the rarity of the card so you'll start seeing these like the orange symbol is a mythic rare the gold uh -huh. one is just rare silver is uncommon and then common is just the blacked out symbol right. um mutate is the new ability that they added that's similar to um I forget what it is basically, but it, it's it's a whole card interaction where instead of paying the main converted mana cost, uh -huh. you're paying the full that that mana cost instead. So instead of paying that extra blue white source or that blue uh, mana source, uh -huh. you're paying the one mana source and then the blue mana source. Um, the flash means that you can play it at any point, and then if at any point you play them, you know you deal with like whenever a creature deals damage or sorry deals combat damage. Right. To a player, you draw a card. So anytime that that I I swing with the octopus, if it goes straight through and does actual combat damage, then I draw a card. And we can get further into why they have to specify combat damage yep. future, but you know. And then you have the the power and power and toughness. Right. So two and it's, two, how much damage it does and how much damage it can take before it it dies. Right. Is there anything in regards to that foil image or that little hologram in the middle? Does that apply um, to anything or just... No, not at all. Like, that's okay. just card design at Got that it. point. Okay. Um, you'll, you'll see it. I, I think all, if not most, of the cards will have them. Um, but that comes down to the same thing as, like, looking at the mythic rares. And mm -hmm. you'll see, like, I, I go through my packs a little faster, which is actually probably why my video is a little shorter, because I'm you'll see spans of time where I'll see a card and I'm like, oh, and I'll just stop and, and set it in. And um, the Honey Mammoth stopped me for a little bit because I was, I was interested mm -hmm. in it. Yeah, um, so we both got tighter. that. We'll be got that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll see a lot of yeah. the, the same. A lot of our commons will be the same. Um, our, our mythics and our rares is probably where it'll vary. See, we both got Yeah, we got that. Tigerilla. Gorilla. And you'll see, like, if I had gone through my whole pack, you would have seen, I think I got, like, 
10 or 15 of that tight gorilla. Uh-huh. Um, he's oddly, oddly big. Um, oddly common. Um, yeah, so this is actually, I think, it is yeah, the, the full video. Um, I was just checking, like, the timestamp to see. Okay. And I had a weird feeling about it, because I was like, I could have sworn that I recorded it properly. So I'm glad that it actually did record properly. <laughs> Um, well, looks like you got a problem trying to open the deck. Ooh. Yeah, the the scissors had some sort of like glue or sure. something on it. It's the scissors. And it was like super struggling. And like you'll see, like I, I just got frustrated. I was like, I'll just pull it apart. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's no big deal. You um, beast. Yeah. Uh, but at that point, I already, I already had the, uh, the nip in it. So I was like, well, I'll just, right. I can do that without bending the cards. And let's see, like I'm looking at all these lands and I'm just like, why? my first foil right but i think i think this was technically already um pack three out of mm-hmm. out of the whole box and i was like wow a foil right off the bat that's great um now there's no is there a, a value other than it looking nice for a foil foils. versus the exact same card but without the foil um no not really um you okay. kind of start to see it more again like when you get more in depth um, and I'm actually kind of glad that I had a smaller timestamp because we can stop and have these pauses. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you'll, you'll start to see a little bit more when you start getting a little bit more in depth. Eventually when you start forming your deck, you know, like this happened to me with my commander deck, I built my deck, I made everything perfect. Um, and then when I made it perfect, you know, I had spent maybe 20 odd dollars trying to improve it and make it functional um and then after spending those 20 dollars i was like well now i'll just go and spend the money on foils and like you know we'll go for the aesthetics and a lot of people don't long-term care about the aesthetics like the aesthetics ultimately don't matter um but you do eventually get to the point where it's almost like it's almost like a humble brag like i don't even have to say like oh look at the card i pulled because the moment that i play it you're gonna you're not just gonna be mad that i'm playing that card in that specific instance, you're going to be uh-huh. like, okay, wow, you're not just pulling out the one card, you're pulling out the one card and it's foil and it's a full art. And like, you know, uh-huh. you'll, you'll see it within the magic community. It happens all the time. Right. Um, that one person that has all of the foil, like perfect full art lands and you're staring at them and you're like, who has the time and money for that? <laughs> like, well, you'd be you surprised. Know. Someone does. Yeah, and you'd right. You go to your local card shop, and you'd be surprised not only the the one single person that's doing it, but like the full groups that are like you know. You actually get to this point where you almost like envy the person that doesn't care because you're like, wow, what's it like to just hold on to your money? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so this is the yeah, that whisper, one card yeah. that we mm-hmm. that we both pulled. And you'll see there, that's the first time I pulled one. So I was like, oh, geez, this is super cool. Um, pulled it closer because I was like, I, maybe I'll pull more. <laughs> um, I don't think I ended up pulling that much more of those. But, well, I mean, out of the, the 10 packs that I did open. Right. Um, but there's, there's a lot of really cool elements. They added a lot of... Um, dual and triple lands so this this set in particular they they very clearly want you to play in three colors Uh um and that's fine um i'm not uncomfortable with three colors i just i'm i'm just barely getting comfortable with two colors i mean that's sort of where you want to be like you don't want to start with just the one color you want to you want that balance in the two separate colors um and then when you get more comfortable with the three colors and everybody will tell you that the four color combination you're like that's out of the world and then using all five colors that's a whole other conversation so that's cool cool little blue spell yeah so there's a there's a bunch of these so like the mutate costs you know you pay the converted mana cost or you play the mutated cost and then that would you know there's card interactions that I still don't entirely recognize uh, at this point. I'm just reading cards that like may or may not go into my main com- main commander deck that seem valuable, but are they valuable enough to swap something out that might be a little bit better in exchange here? I think I was looking at that card and it was just like such good art. Um, 
that's one thing that I appreciate with Magic, though, is that, like, mm-hmm. unlike other card games, you can focus on things like the art and still make something valuable and, yeah, you know, a- appreciate all aspects of the of the set. Now, uh, uh, I'm, I'm stumbling here, but hasn't yeah. people uh, used Magic cards to do D and D, like you know, whether whatever creatures that? So I can't imagine they would use the images. Um, yeah, I mean, I think they've done something similar because it's the same company. Um, like I know Wizards of the Coast recently released a couple of magic sets within, um, D&D in particular. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the, uh, what do they call them? The, the planes that Mm -hmm. exist within magic exist within D&D. Um, and they're all like canonical to the greater magic story. Um, but as far as like integrating both, I can see someone bringing in like the characters from from Magic into D and D, like because like I said, they brought in those modules that use right. those characters. Um, but they wouldn't be interchangeable. You wouldn't you wouldn't be able to use anything. I mean, you might be able to use some of the cards within like right. uh, a Magic homebrew, but I don't know how efficient it would be. Um, but they do have, like I said, like you know, there there are some of those magic planes as playable modules in D and D. And I, I think I told you that because you have mm-hmm. a couple of the Ravinica little characters, mm-hmm. and then those characters play into the the magic modules. Right. And I think I don't know if it's this set or one of the next sets, but they're they're releasing a, a follow up module for for magic and so with magic it's actually kind of something cool because it's sort of like not that i would love to make this comparison i'm sure a lot of people would correct me otherwise but it's a lot like uh rick and marty where there's this like infinite universe of universes and Mm -hmm. all of that ties in somewhere um so it has sort of that same that same overlay where a big part of it is um, the planeswalkers, and you'll see uh-huh. in in a moment. I don't think it's this pack. I think it's one of the next ones. But um, I end up pulling one of those planeswalkers, and all of those planeswalkers have stories. And the reason they're called planeswalkers is because Ikoria is its own plane. So was Throne of Eldraine. So was Theros, and like all these different places, and all of those tie into the bigger like magic lore. Um, so that's something that I've been focusing on my own time is getting into said magic lore because it's so deep and all of these cards like you know you'll see like migratory beasts where you're like oh it's a nothing card but then you get something like um i think i pull one of them but it it's a very specific card that um i think i was telling you my friend was telling me about the lore uh but part of the lore was everybody was super excited because they thought they were reprinting this card and part of the lore was the story behind like why would why would this person in particular be in the Ikoria plane like uh-huh. what's the meaning behind that and then they release it and it's like a nothing like it's just part of the art style so they're in there somewhere in the story but nobody understands why yet um, nice. but the, they're not technically a playable card so actually in this art well we passed it already but uh-huh. um, you'll see Vivian and I think Maybe this was the pack where I pulled her. I'm not sure. But you you see a lot of it, and you see, Mm -hmm. like, bits and pieces of the story in the different cards that explain you the different factions. And it's sort of like a trickle effect. So it's like the different card that explains the different faction and the different faction that's in this plane and it's in that plane and their purpose beyond, you know, um, who the all the different archetypes in the cards and like, uh-huh. um, there's packs of jesters and there's, uh, what is it? There's aristocrats and all this. And, and in the card types, they exist. And then within that existence, they have uh-huh. a reason why they exist within the magic universe. So it's cool to see. Um, yeah. So you see, I was, I was pretty quick cause I was, I, I'm used to it at this point of like, open packs and i'm like all right i've seen this i've seen this i've seen this um, <laughs> on to the next one so this little main character on the front of this pack 
that's Vivian. Uh -huh. And Vivian's one of the planeswalkers that's within this set. So like I was saying with the lore, she has a greater lore into why she's in this plane. Versus like you won't see any of her cards within Theros because she wasn't in the Theros uh, story frame. So it's it's fun to see those those little lore things. I like I said, I have one friend that he's just he he gets into it and he gets so deep into the lore and he'll explain stuff to me and uh you know he'll we'll be playing and he'll just start giggling and I'm like what's so funny you know and he's just <laughs> like well let me explain to you why it's funny why this card took out this card and these interactions happen and why that's interesting because of the bigger lore that co goes along with those two cards and it right. it's fun to see. Um, so here I started taking it a little bit slower because I was like, well, you know, maybe I'll see something I didn't, maybe, maybe I'll see something I wasn't expecting to see. Um, so yeah, like I said, there's, there's a lot of beast heavy cards and that's, that's where we stopped. I don't know why it cut off at that point, but, um, okay. maybe... Is that the next one? Yeah, this might be the continuation of it because um, okay. that's already where I had the stack. So maybe it was just, you know, cutting and going. Um, I haven't seen where I pulled Vivian already, but I imagine it's in here somewhere. So yeah, maybe maybe the file type just got too big and then it swapped into two, two yeah. videos, which would make sense. But who knows at that point? I'm telling you, I should have just recorded the whole box. <laughs> Eventually, the box got pretty, got pretty good. Uh, so this was one of the main porky cards that parrot. I was. Nice. Yeah, the porky parrot, mm -hmm. and you'll see something pretty funny within the next couple cards. Uh, so I get the porky parrot. I get the fun little cat nightmare. Uh, maybe I'll play with that one. Um, and then I think within, I think it's the next card. It's somewhere in one of these packs, but wait, boom, another Porky Parrot in the exact same pack. I, wow. I, you can see the pause because I'm just like, what? well, this one's not foil, but why? Right, exactly. <laughs> but still. Um, and that's just how it is. That's the, that's the random generation in this game is, you know, you, you open packs and you can still see again, like how I'm, I'm already laughing because I'm like, how did I pull two of the same card? One's foil, one's not uh -huh. foil. So how did I pull two of the same card in one pack? <laughs> um, that's one of those things that happens in Magic where, you know, if my friends had seen that, they'd be like, go play the lotto, that's it. Like, <laughs> something like that doesn't happen every day. Right. So you'll see, yeah. So like I said, um, I think this pack in particular showcases it a little... A little better than other packs but just that uh -huh. heavy chimera theme where you're just seeing like the porky parrot and you'll uh -huh. hear you saw the um the flying cat and the like what was it it was like the the legendary cat creature that was uh -huh. in there that one so like a lot of those creatures that like you're looking at them and you're like oh that's clearly made up of four different monsters right. that i can play with it's a little token dual lands so that dual land might end up so Here's that's where vivian. i pulled out yeah so that's where i pulled out vivian you know and so with her like deposit real quick um mm -hmm. she does a, a couple different things and this is a good explanation when you're playing is basically what planeswalkers do is that they're not creatures so they they don't have uh, a power and toughness and mm -hmm. they can't technically attack um but if i give her a loyalty point she creates a creature that can attack with mm -hmm. my choice of one of those counters which is where these counters come in because now they play into effect so so you'd be giving it to a creature token that didn't have it otherwise so you right. want this to market um within play groups you probably won't see a whole lot of people using those but you never know um and then the minus that lets me basically cheat stuff in right um so it's cool to see those but she does have a greater lore within ikoria where you know, you're going to look at all these different reasons. There's other planeswalkers that play into her and they both have a different lore on why they do or don't interact with each other. Hmm. Um, so it's, it's kind of cool to see. If she, for example, if she has mm -hmm. that kind of influence and I saw one with mind, 
would that be something that would be like if she sends up a creature out to attack could you counter with something something similar like that to kind of like um override what was right well so she so basically what would happen in the case that i use her to summon that um mm-hmm. i believe it's a three three it's a three three beast with my choice of vigilance trample or um one other key word Uh um so what'll happen is that'll come into my field um i believe it would probably still come out summon sick because it's the first turn that it comes out and then on your turn if you choose to attack i can still choose it to have um to to use it as a blocker or i can attack um you can i think technically interrupt it being cast okay um or coming into the field like you you can still counter and remove it um, but that would have to be after it resolves because you wouldn't right. counter the loyalty point. You would counter the action of the creature. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the most part, nine times out of 10, it would resolve because you're, you're talking about the counter of a potential blocker over, mm-hmm. you know, what if you use that counter on that blocker, but in my next turn, I play something else that you could have countered better. Um, right. So like something, maybe me playing a counter and then you counter my counter. Um, right. You know, playing it for that as opposed to like getting rid of my 3 3, it, it just might not be viable in the long run. But, right. you know. So you see a lot of these. Um, mm-hmm. And I think in this pack, I got into like a few more cards that I, I didn't really, I, I hadn't really seen. This of one mind was pretty common. Yeah um so there's a there's a couple pretty good ones i can i can see myself creating a standard or limited deck fairly easily out of these cards but it's just a matter of trying trying to like sitting down and actually do it yeah um so that's where yes i think that's where i reached the end of mine um there might be one more pack coming in because I, I think i ended it there you go yeah <laughs> i was like i was like did i i'm i'm pretty sure i did because i specifically i had stacked them like that on purpose is what it came down to Catbird. the little cat bird <laughs> so so that's another one of the like heavy chimera themes that i was like right. that's actually not that bad it's super cute i don't think i'll ever use cat bird even though i'll want to use cat bird <laughs> um so that full art so this one i have to go back mm-hmm. and see what that card does because right. some of those legendary artifacts tend to be pretty useless some of them um or at least for me i don't i don't typically use them and, and again when you're looking at building your your deck you would lean it let's say less relying on artifacts but more on let's say what the um, sorcery aspect or it depends um there's no wrong way to build i mean there is if you just like shove a bunch of random cards that don't play together um mm-hmm. i'm the prime example of like i have no idea how to build anything if i right. put it together i'm like there there's kind of uh, an end goal there but it, it gets lost on itself i i try to do too much all at once um right it's really hard for me to like rein myself in. Um, so yeah, so that was the last pack. And then this is, right, uh, and this is just the replay of it. Um, we'll just leave that up for now, but um, okay. yeah. So what ends up happening is it depends. Um, everybody has a different play style. Um, I'll use my friends and my commander deck. So my, my commander deck in particular focuses on token creation and boosting up a couple of my pitch hitter, like monsters Mm -hmm. um the main goal in my deck is ultimately to create a super wide field so even if you have answers to me having an otherwise infinite field those answers don't matter because my my answers are more infinite than your answers are or Mm -hmm. hopefully are um my friend's deck on the other hand uh has this clause where he's going infinite in a different way so he likes to do this thing and we learn when we play against each other where 
in his deck, he's focusing on life gain and life loss, which means he's going to gain life, but for every life that he's gaining, you're losing five or six at a time. Right. So he has full card combinations where what don't, well, you know, if he has these two, three or four plus cards out at, at the same time, uh, uh-huh. all he has to do is hit you the one time and he enters a cycle where you're losing a life and he's gaining a life. And because he's gaining a life, you're losing another life. But because right. you lost that life, he's gaining another one. But because he gained that one, and so it just becomes this cycle of like, mm-hmm. nobody can play anymore because now that the rules will dictate, this action keeps happening until you get to zero. Right. <laughs> so there's no wrong way. Um, there's entire decks that are dedicated to not even winning just shutting down your answers so everything you play there's a response to like no you can't do that no you can't do that and the goal is not i'm gonna win the goal is neither of us are winning right um so it doesn't count as a win for anybody but it doesn't count as a loss for anybody because you didn't lose you just didn't win and i didn't win i just didn't lose right um so so it depends it depends on what you're trying to do and that's where it gets kind of like more in depth in the lore aspect of things you know i have a friend whose full deck um is surrounded around merfolk and the entire idea behind the deck is to build her field super wide so she basically what that translates to is she puts down as many monsters as she can Mm -hmm. specifically merfolk Uh, all of her merfolk have eventually have island walk and what I, Island Walk says is that if anybody who you're playing against has an island on the field, her hits just go automatically. You can't block, you can't do anything about it. So now you're thinking like, oh, well, what happens? Well, if, what if I'm not playing blue and I don't have islands, right? Her answer to that is she has cards in her, in her deck that turn all of your, your, your lands into islands. So they still have their main color. So like in mine, I I play green, white. But when she plays this card, all of my green, white lands turn Mm -hmm. into green, blue lands or blue, white lands or green, blue, white lands. So what ends up happening is now she's created that instant where there's nothing you can do. Your back's against the wall. You mean, you can counter it in the moment, but Mm -hmm. if you don't counter it in the moment, the next turn, she's dealing damage, you know? Um, she has full decks where you're drawing a card and from her drawing a card, you're losing a life. Right. And so then her turn, she's drawing 10, 15 cards at a time. So you're still watching her do it and you're like, well, all right, I've lost one. I've lost one. I've lost one. And she's on the 15th life and you're like, can we just stop now? <laughs> you know? Um, so, so yeah, to bring it back around, I mean, you can focus on sorceries. A lot of it comes down to... Um, as far as my friends have told me, because again, I'm, I'm really bad at it. I've tried and I'm learning. I'm slowly learning. I'm getting better at it. But um, mm-hmm. what you want to focus is on, on keywords. So like, you know, even on some of these cards, like, you know, uh, like with Vivian. So Vivian, I don't know how I got to Vivian so easily, um, but she creates this three, three green beast creature token And then I can put a Vigilance, Reach, or Trample counter Uh on it. So um, in my deck in particular that creates tokens, she would actually be a viable card. Because I I can, first of all, at any point, I can look at the top card of my my deck. If it's a creature, I can cast it from straight there. So I can play it in for free. Um, On once per turn, I can create a new creature. And so in my deck in particular, where I want to focus on creating those token creatures, um, each turn I get a free one. And then if I have the right cards in place, each turn I get three of those. And then from getting three of those, I'm also gaining life from three of those. And then because I'm gaining life from three of those and those are all coming in, then my main creature is gaining that much life. So, So... it depends. It depends on what you're trying to do on the deck. Um, a lot of it is just, like I said, getting getting comfortable with those keywords. Um, so, like, you know, again, Vivian's a perfect one for my deck, and I, I'm still trying to figure out what card comes out in place for it. But, you know, you have, like, your minus two. So 
you know, she comes in with three loyal, loyalty points. So right. on turn one, I can say minus two. Whenever I cast my next creature spell, then I get to search my library for a creature spell with a lesser converted mana cost, and that card comes straight into the field. So double so, mm -hmm. Vivian gets to cheat stuff in. So basically what that means to say is if, um, you know, her converted mana cost is ultimately five, so uh, two greens and three of any color. If I go and I pull something like, um, I don't, I'm just trying to find a card at this point. Um, that's not a good example. Actually, you know, why not? So they would never be in the same deck together, but I find Godzilla, mm -hmm. right? I use her ability to see Godzilla. Godzilla right. has a converted mana cost of seven, mm. right? I use her minus two ability. So right. her minus two ability now says that I can look out, I can pull out any creature that comes from my deck with a lower converted mana cost of seven. So it'll be five then. Or right. six or four. Oh, or wait, two. whatever that cost is, right. is less than two. Got it. Right. So as long as it's less than that converted mana cost, right. then um, that card can be played immediately straight from my deck. Just, all right, I'm playing Godzilla. Boom. Okay. So I played Godzilla. Godzilla comes in. I can go and find Godzilla King of the Monsters. Boom. They're both on the field. So, right. you know, I get to play those cards at a faster rate than what I normally would have. So, like, again, for my deck in particular, that's perfect because my converted mana costs are all fairly close together, especially for creatures. They're fairly close together. And I can get to um, what we would refer to as my infinite combo combos. We'd get to them like that. We, it would just be boom, 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 and my field's growing. Um, and, you know, you can always target those creatures, and or you can target Planeswalkers, So because at any point, you can choose to attack me, or you can choose to attack my Planeswalker. And if my field's not open, if you, you know, attack Vivian, and she's still at three loyalty points, and you attack her with four, she's gone. So she's not invincible. She's just, you know. No, but it's, it's, a, it's a strong conduit to, to benefit the player right. to bring out a lot more things that you would not be able to do on right. a normal turn. So. Yeah, in fairness, as much as I say that right. she's, and that's a big part of it, as much as I say right. that she 100% goes into my deck, there's also a big possibility that I'm like, she goes into my deck, but I know the moment I play her, someone's going to shut it down of course. within seconds. Like, right. I'm, she's not going to be out on the field for that long. Um, okay. She's going to come in, serve her purpose, and that would be it. Right. Um, All right. So that brings us to an end to our first video podcast. This is our first unboxing video for Magic the Gathering. But as Alex and I had mentioned before, we plan to do more recordings about how to build a deck and some actual gameplay. So in the meantime, if you cannot go to your local branch, your local branch can come to you. Download Hoopla Digital through our library's website. You can actually get strategy guides. You can even look at the visual history guide, which is really cool. And it's for free. So no excuse for you not to be caught up on how to play Magic the Gathering. But in the meantime, on behalf of Alex, myself, until we meet again at the library, stay safe. Good night.